Ja, Amsterdam en slavernij op het wereldtoneel. Dat thema staat centraal in het tweede panelgesprek onder leiding van Wim Manuhutu. Want hoe breed en omvangrijk was de betrokkenheid van de hoofdstad? U gaat het horen van de panelleden Marjolein Kars, Matthias van Rossum, Nira Wikramasing en Andrea Mosterman. Wim Manuhutu. Um, ja, dam, dames en heren, ook uh, uh, de mensen in de twee aanpalende zalen. Uh, omdat het thema Amsterdam wereldwijd is, schakelen we nu uh, ook over um, naar het Engels. And we will continue our conversation in, uh, in English. And we have a very, um, we have a very uh, distinguished uh, panel of authors with us. Uh, two of whom are calling in from the United States of America. So good morning to you and we are very happy that you are uh, with us. And um, I'm filling in actually for Matthias van Rossum, who is watching uh, on a screen because uh, as one of the four editors and the, the remaining editors, uh, Juno Jones and Nancy Jauer are in the room, um, would be the ones uh, leading the panels, if not for a very legitimate and happy reason. Matthias is on the brink of, uh, after having fathered a book that recently came out, of actually becoming a father. And so, um, he, yes, yes, and, and do uh, uh, join us uh, in, in applauding uh, this. Uh, so, at any moment now, he can be called away, and therefore, um, it was better for him to be uh, in a place where he could actually rush uh, in order to uh, receive the biggest gift uh, one can, uh, can imagine, even more than an academic book, right, Matthias? Uh, and therefore, uh, I'm filling in. Uh, my name is Vimana Hutu, and I was privileged to be one of the uh, authors uh, of this book. But because of the fact that perhaps... Uh, Matthias, and we will actually uh, follow the same format as we did uh, in the first panel. So each and every one of the authors will be given the opportunity to briefly uh, present or, uh, the highlights of, uh, of the chapter that uh, she or he has uh, written. And afterwards, we will enter into a conversation and include uh, also our friends in uh, both the Basel and in Vereniging on Suriname to, to join us in that conversation. But to start off with you, uh, Matthias, uh, besides being uh, one of the uh, editors, you um, also uh, wrote this chapter on the VOC, the Verenigde Oost-Indische Compagnie, and especially the important role that Amsterdam played in the establishment and actually in the policies of the VOC. So could you briefly um, point out some of the highlights of, of your chapter? Um, yes, thanks, Wim. Uh, I hope you can, can hear me. Um, yeah, so uh, very shortly, I, I think the, 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 the core of the chapter is that um, uh, it explores the role of, of Amsterdam in the Dutch East India Company and uh, in uh, the history of slavery and slave trade uh, uh, that uh, the Dutch East India Company sort of uh, initi initiates. Um, and I think that the core uh, uh, argument of it is that there is a very active and very conscious uh, uh, policy very early on um, to, to engage in a very violent and aggressive policy of colonization in the Indian Ocean uh, and Indonesian archipelago worlds. Um, and that, uh, that policy of colonization uh, is, is directly linked uh, to uh, ideas of how to use uh, slavery, uh, how to enslave people and how to trade uh, and slave people um, uh, and what and, and how to use slavery also in, in terms of uh, production of, of those uh, global commodities that the Dutch East India Company wanted to, to trade in Asia. Um, Amsterdam, 
the city of Amsterdam and Amsterdam uh, mayors uh, and the elite of Amsterdam has a very um, important role in that actually because they um, are uh, 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 the center of a political faction in the Dutch Republic that very early on um, uh, is is one of the uh, sort of drivers of this very aggressive colonial policy. Um, and there's a conflict, political conflict in the Dutch Republic uh, about this, but very early on, Amsterdam becomes one of the centers of of, of this aggressive uh, political uh, of of this aggressive colonial uh, uh, policy, uh, with Amsterdam Mayor Reinier Pau, for example, being one of the, the main figures in this. Uh, and that really uh, um, uh, has its its um, impact on the Dutch East India Company policies already in the 1610s. Um, and that leads also to the uh, appointment of, for example, uh, someone as Jan Pieter Schoen Koen, who uh, uh, is a very strong and, and, and very uh, strongly connected to this very violent politics of colonization and, and, and genocide on the Banda Islands. Um, um, so yeah, I think that that is the, the, the main conclusion of the article, right? So that you cannot understand the role of Amsterdam in the Dutch East India Company without looking at very aggressive, violent colonial politics that are particularly linked to uh, the expansion of slavery in the Dutch East India Company world. Thank you, Matthias, for being very succinct. It's a very rich chapter, and uh, obviously anyone who would like to know more should read the book. And I will actually follow the chapters in the book by introducing uh, some of the, uh, 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 the other uh, panelists that we have in our uh, wonderful panel now. And uh, then, if I follow the book, first up is uh, Dr. Andrea uh, Mosserman, who is uh, an associate professor with the University of uh, New Orleans. So good morning to you, uh, Andrea. And um, I should say congratulations because you were awarded uh, the Hendricks Award that is given out annually by the uh, Netherlands, New Netherlands Institute for a manuscript of a book that will be published on uh, the history of uh, enslavement uh, in Dutch New York, and hopefully we will be able to talk about this later on uh, in, in the course of our panel. But please, would you first uh, highlight the, the chapter that you've written as your contribution to this, uh, to this study? Yes, Wim, thank you, and thank you uh, so much for having me, and thank you for um, allowing me to contribute to this book. It was really a pleasure and an honor to be able to do so. I, uh, in my research on New Netherland and later on Dutch New York, there, um, uh, there's one ship that arrives in the harbor of New Amsterdam, 1664, just about, just before the English take over the colony. And that was the ship, uh, the Gideon. It arrived there with 290 enslaved men and women. And um, when I started working on this particular chapter, what I was looking into is what exactly was the history in the context of the Gideon. What I found is that the Gideon uh, was actually contracted by the Amsterdam Chamber of the West India Company to bring these enslaved people to New Amsterdam, a fourth of which were going to go to the Amsterdam city colony. So this was a city colony of the city of Amsterdam um, called the New at Amstel. And this was a colony on uh, what today is the Delaware in the state of Delaware. And in the fall of 1663, the city of Amsterdam agreed with the Dutch West India Company that they would together contract uh, Simon Gilda and the ship de Gideon to bring these and save people to the city of New Amsterdam, a fourth of which then were going to go to this colony um, that belonged to the actual city of Amsterdam. The ship uh, traveled via West Central Africa. It um, traveled to Curaçao. They, um, Hilda, the captain of the ship, uh, purchased um, 421 people in West Central Africa. Uh, 348 of these people survived the journey to Curaçao. Many of them were very ill with scurvy. 
And uh, this is why, in fact, uh, Vice Director Beck in Curaçao uh, wrote to Peter Stuyvesant that he did not initially want to bring these people to New Amsterdam because they were so very ill. Uh, they, uh, according to Beck, exchanged some of these people with people that had already been in Curaçao, and eventually the ship left Curaçao with 300 people, 290 of whom actually survived in New Amsterdam, uh, who arrived in New Amsterdam and survived this journey. Of those people, 72 were taken off board by um, uh, officials of the New Amstel colony. And as far as I can tell, they did actually end up in New Amstel uh, soon after the English take over the colony. And so uh, it's very likely, and some of the records suggest that many of these people actually ended up in Maryland on um, working on the plantations there after the English had taken over the colony. So in my research, uh, I actually uncovered some of these things that I did not know, even having worked on this topic for so long, but really closely looking to the journey of the Gideon itself, I found that the involvement of the city of Amsterdam was much more than its being the, the chamber of the West India Company that was um, really largely in charge of, of new, the New Netherland colony, but in fact, the city of Amsterdam owned a colony there and had asked and saved people to be brought there. Uh, they actually uh, contributed to the, the ship, its provisioning and everything, so they actually contributed it to it in, in real ways, and they then actually got these people uh, to bring to their colony in the hope that these unsafe people could help them develop this really struggling colony. A very intriguing and wonderful story and, and happy that you are saying that even though you have been studying this topic for, for years now, there are always new things to discover and, uh, and, and we will revisit uh, your story uh, later on in the conversation and in the spirit of actually covering both uh, the East and the West, we now move to Professor Nira Vikramasinghe of Leiden University, the director of um, the Modern Asia, South Asia Studies uh, uh, Institute at Leiden University. And Nira, um, together with Alicia Schricker, uh, another wonderful historian from, from Leiden, you wrote a chapter on uh, the role of, of the VOC in South Asia. Could you, could you bring out some of the more spectacular or interesting th or new things that you found in, in, in your chapter? Uh, yes, well, thank you very much. First of all, uh, I'm really honored to be part of this uh, project. Um, as, as you mentioned, it's a co-authored piece uh, with my colleague Alicia Schricker, and it focuses uh, on the way in which um, slavery and the slave trade played a role in the operations of the VOC in present day, I'm just going to say the countries because sometimes South Asia is not very clear in people's mind. Uh, so India, uh, Sri Lanka, and Myanmar in this particular case, right? Um, this is something that uh, Alicia and I have been working on for quite some time together. And I can say something about that maybe later. Although our focus has been more on the enslaved themselves, that's really the materiality of slavery, rather than on slavers and um, merchants, you know, and, and more on the local scene than, than Europe. But in spite of that, we, we did find enough uh, information to write this uh, chapter on the involvement of uh, Amsterdam city and uh, city merchants in slavery. Now, what we uh, come to is that just as I think other contributions to the vol volume, uh, slave trade may not have been the core business of the BOC, yet slavery, bondage, and trade in humans formed an integrated feature of the BOC presence uh, in the region. Because the BOC had no initial interest in South Asia because of the spices, you know, pepper in Malabar, cinnamon in Ceylon. Now you know why <clears throat> there's always cinnamon in your apple tarts. And it's textile production, you know, Bengal, Coromandel. And uh, basically the, in the, bis the this business interest led the Dutch to conquer and rule port cities like Cochin, Colombo, Jaffna, Gaul, 
from where they increasingly control the spice producing areas in the hinterlands. And uh, in some areas, you know, for example, in Ceylon, uh, that's today Sri Lanka, the coastal areas, the VOC eventually developed an outright colonial power. Um, and uh, Dutch interest in Indian slaves was driven by the demand for labor in Batavia, for example, uh, for the company spice plantations in, in Banda, which uh, Matthias also mentioned. Uh, in uh, numerical terms, it's very difficult to actually give a very, uh, you know, precise, detailed uh, figure. But R Richard Allen gives an estimate that in the 17th century, a Dutch exports, as it were, of humans from India amounted to about 100,000 people, you know, who were sent all over the Indian Ocean world from Indonesia to Sri Lanka to uh, Cape. Then we also look in this chapter, you know, at uh, some specific Amsterdam commanders and the human cargo that they carried through a study of uh, shipping lists. And you find that the cargo, you know, was of enslaved bodies mixed with large quantities of other products such as pepper, cinnamon, salt, uh, coffee, etc. You know? um, the chapter also touches upon the modalities of becoming enslaved. So how were people enslaved? You know, what, were the, uh, what was it caused by? Uh, so traditionally famine, debt, conflict, you know, were the main precursors to enslavement. And also, interestingly, the Dutch facilitated the trade in many ways through, uh, you know, uh, providing deeds which, uh, and notarial services. And also, in many ways, you know, they appropriated certain uh, older forms of bondage and then uh, used it, you know, and sort of codified them to, uh, to their own uh, purpose. So uh, the chapter concludes that in many ways, the VOC was com complicit in enslavement, slavery and slave trade in South Asia. Ships carried humans as cargo with products and animals. And although the VOC operated in a social world, ra I mean, largely defined by unfreedom, enslavability in South Asia was reserved for people who were considered racially different by the Dutch. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you also for, for bringing this, this element of, of race again in, in the conversation. And now, because of, of time, uh, we move on quickly to, to our last um, panelist. And the word Maryland uh, was already mentioned. And we are ha very happy to have her with us, uh, Dr. Marilena Karsh, who's an associate professor at the University of Maryland in Baltimore County. Um, and in her chapter, in your chapter, you, you highlight uh, one element that was mentioned earlier this, uh, this, uh, this afternoon, the element of resistance. And so could you please briefly um, explain what your chapter is all about? Yes, thank you all. Thank you all for having me. It was great to contribute to this book. Uh, my chapter is based on a book that I just published called Blood in the River that will come out in the Netherlands in January in a Dutch translation that deals with what was probably one of the biggest slave rebellions in the Caribbean, and it happened in the Dutch colony. It happened in a colony that nobody's ever heard of called Der Beast, now part of the Republic of Guyana. And between four to 5,000 enslaved people, just about all the enslaved people who lived there, engaged in this rebellion that lasted more than a year. So it's amazingly successful. And really, only the Haitian Revolution is more successful than this one. And the colony was owned by a company called the Societeit van Berbies, the Society of Berbies, which was located in Amsterdam. And the chapter is about the involvement of the Societeit in suppressing this rebellion, mostly by um, mobilizing their political and economic supporters, their investors, many of whom lived in Amsterdam, to convince the, the States General, the Staten-Generaal, 
that this company was too big to fail, that they could not afford to suppress this rebellion, that they needed a million guilders and a huge uh, fleet uh, and and, uh, military expedition to go to Berbice and suppress this revolt. And that's what happened. So the chapter talks about the amazing amount of military hardware and food, pigs, chickens, tents, boats, and soldiers that were sent by the society to Berbice to defeat these four to 5,000 enslaved folks who had no allies, could not be re-enslaved across the Atlantic, and who lost primarily because they did not have this, they didn't have allies, and the Dutch not only had this economic might of the Dutch Republic behind them, but Native Americans who supported them and helped fight the rebels. So that's what my chapter is about. Okay, and one question that immediately pops up, and this is basically the question I would like to ask all of you. What do you hope that a general non-academic public, because you all publish in academic circles, wonderful academic books, but this is definitely a book that is uh, aimed at a broader audience, what would you hope that readers from the book in general, but from your p- chapter in particular, take away from, from what you have written? And perhaps, Marilena, I, I, I start with you and then trail back to, to Nira, Andrea, and end up with uh, Matthias, who is still with us. So, Marilena. Thank you. Well, what I hope people will take away from it uh, fits a little bit with what with with what one of the questioners asked in the last session when she said, "How are we going to bring this to kids in schools?" And I think this story of the rebellion is a real inspiring one. Um, and I'm hoping that by talking about how it was suppressed because of the involvement of the city of Amsterdam. I can get people interested in this rebellion, which was so massive and it's hardly known. People know about it in Guyana, of course, but it's hardly known outside of Guyana. And it's a very inspiring story. And it's also a story that that contributes to the intellectual history of enslaved people. Because in this rebellion, we see that enslaved or formerly enslaved rebel leaders want something different uh, than the, the the great majority of enslaved people. And so it, it clues us into what enslaved people hoped for in their futures, what life after emancipation would look like uh, for them. Um, but it also shows us how a group of enslaved people managed to put the Dutch on the defensive for more than a year. Yes. So... So I, I hope the, the, rebe- the rebellion becomes better known and will serve as an inspiration to, to, to kids in the Netherlands. Great. And there is this new neighborhood that will be um, having streets named after people who resisted uh, colonial rule. I'm not sure whether uh, Kofi or Kofi is, is in, a, in, in the list of, of, of people who are um, listed for, for being, uh, having stri- streets uh, named after them, but definitely he should be included. So thank you very much. Nira, what, what if, if people read your chapter, read the book, what, sh- what should they take away from Alicia and, and your, your chapter? Mm-hmm. Well, I think <clears throat> a few simple, simple things. I think one is that there actually was slavery in the Indian Ocean world which is not known, I mean, uh, not, not, not commonly known at least. There seems to be a kind of like bifurcation. Kuno Jones uses this, this term in one of his chapters, you know, between colonialism in Indonesia and slavery in Suriname, you know, and there's this kind of mental map that is done. And in the middle, India, Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka was for 150 years under Dutch rule. Very few people know that, you know, that we've got, Roman Dutch law still in one of the few three countries in the world, you know. So, so th- there are all these um, sort of um, you know uh, gaps in 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 I think people's uh, understanding of what went on in the 17th and 18th century. And uh, I think if this chapter even sort of instills some curiosity to to look further and to 
because there is uh, a lot written about this, and especially in the last five years. So I think if people want to find information, they, they, they can find it. Thank you, and I'm, I'm sure that they, find, they will find your chapter uh, a very inspiring start for their, for their journey. Andrea, how about, how about you? How about Dutch New York, the Gideon, and, and other work that you're involved in? Um, so this is a, an important and also in some ways a difficult question. Uh, but I, I, of course, this particular chapter, I hope that people see how actively involved Amsterdam was in the, uh, the, the trade and colonization in North America and, and the trade of enslaved people. Um, more broadly, I think that uh, I hope that it will show the significance of slavery and enslaved people in Dutch colonization in North America. In fact, um, when the English took over the colony just uh, after the Gideon arrived, afterwards, according to some, Peter Stuyvesant actually uh, said that he was not able to hold on to the colony because this ship with 300 hungry enslaved people arrived in the colony and that he had to use his provisions to actually feed these people rather than be able to feed the soldiers. And so this is very pivotal moment in Dutch history that we all know of. We don't really know this context. And so I hope that some of this will become more evident. And if I may, um, James Baldwin actually spoke about this moment and about Peter Stuyvesant's um, uh, uh, blaming this on the enslaved people and the arrival, and he does so in the in the preface of this book. And I want to just quote him, if I may. It's just a few sentences. He says, "And a marvelous foreshadowing of the scapegoat role the black was to play in American life is contained in Peter Stuyvesant's explanation of his surrender to the British. The city could not withstand the British siege," he explained, "because 300 slaves brought in just before the British arrived in the harbor." had eaten all the surplus food. Scarcely any American politician has since improved on this extraordinarily convincing way of explaining American reverses. And so I hope that there's more attention to these, these long lasting uh, effects and influences that slavery, the slave trade, but also the people who, who really helped build the colony and the region for the city of Amsterdam and for the Netherlands in general, and the Dutch people who remain there. Thank you. So, Matthias, um, there's probably so much to say, but be brief. Yeah, um, yeah. so I talked already about the role of Amsterdam in, in this story. Um, um, so I think that is a takeaway, but, but thinking about what um, would be good if, the, if, the, if a wider audience would take away from, from perhaps well, this chapter or the book as a whole, I think three three points. Um, first, um, as Mira mentioned, that there is slavery in, in basically every part of the Dutch uh, colonial world from very early on. But related to that point, I would say that, um, of course, uh, there's local and uh, regional differences in, in, in how slavery manifests itself and, how, and, and, and what trajectory it takes. But, but that in the end, the... the the form of slavery in, in, in these different parts of the, of the Dutch colonial world is very comparable. I think that is a very important point um, to take away and, and to, to discuss and explore further, I think. Um, second, um, that this is uh, not only a history that, that takes part either outside Europe or the Netherlands or inside uh, Europe. Or the Netherlands. Normally, I'm more involved in, in sort of social histories of slavery and enslaved people uh, outside Europe. So for this chapter, I had to to dive into that history in Europe or in the Netherlands. But the takeaway here, I think, is that these histories are very interwoven, and you can't understand them if you really see how they are connected. Uh, and there, of course, the role of Amsterdam is very sort of a, an eye opener, also to to me on on how much interaction in, in sort of relation there is between that history in the Netherlands and outside the Netherlands, outside mm. Europe. And then third, I think uh, related to that point is the enormous impact of uh, Dutch colonial history. And in this, in my case, the, what I studied then the Dutch East India Company empire and colonial expansion, its violence, its 
slavery, its slave trade on non-European societies uh, and on people's lives. Uh, I think that enormous impact would be the, the third uh, takeaway of, of, of my chapter, or at least the book as a, as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and actually, while, while listening to you, it's so amazing that, of course, in, in, the, in the ages that, and the centuries that you were all talking about, conversations like this would take weeks and even months of sending out letters and waiting for months for a reply. And so with all the, the technical difficulties that uh, might occur, this is uh, already, uh, uh, of course, very, very important that we can have these con uh, global conversations actually on the global reach of uh, the involvement of Amsterdam in colonialism and also in the involvement of the city of Amsterdam in all forms of bonded labor and and enslavement. We, we would like now to go uh, first to, to, to our friends in De Basel, so the um, uh, city archive of, of Amsterdam, uh, De Basel. Uh, uh, so one might say uh, the stock exchange is calling for De Basel now. Yomi, are you with us? But Gilly is. Well, uh, while we are waiting for the connection on the Basel, I would like to turn to Gilly. Gilly, do you have a question? You can ask this question in Dutch, and most of the panelists will understand, but do it in English if you want to. Please. Okay. Uh, uh, f uh, first of all, I, uh, I would like to thank everybody for uh, your contribution, because we hear things which, uh, uh, yeah, which en enlighten us. You know, which which reveal things that we did not know. Uh, yet one question remains um, uh, uh, from from the, uh, the 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 previous question was not answered, and the, uh, my audience asked me. Uh, they said there was a question as which was not answered, and that question was why there are uh, uh, <laughs> no real black people, you know, as in uh, 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 African people involved with uh, uh, the research of the book. This question was asked by the young lady in the first round, and there was no answer to that. And uh, um, next to that, I have a young lady uh, sitting next to me who uh, wants to put a question to, to all of you. I give her the headphone so she can hear what she's saying. Sure. Uh, okay, she says it's not about this particular subject, but maybe we can still uh, um, look at the question. Shall we do that? Just put your question and we'll see. If there's an answer or not. Here. Come and take the Yeah. Hi, well, it's not, a, it's not really a, really a, um, a question, but only um, just to say about the research you have done and um, what it also means for me as an individual from African and Suriname uh, descendants. descendants. And I have also um, looked the way how um, now the past was present in the here and now. So I write all my experience in a book, and that book is also uh, right now at some publishers to look at, to, to look at it. And it describes um, the whole past which it's about 250 years ago, and which was still alive right from, now. So from, from your own uh, experience. Yes. Yes. So, so the question in general, I guess you could say, is in how far uh, did you, uh, uh, the, the writers of the book, the people involved in the book, uh, involve not only historical facts, but also the experiences of the individual uh, 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 black people who, who say we carry the history within our genes and within in our daily experiences. In how far did you take that with you in the book? This is the question. Very clear. Thank you very much. Um, not to be, um, not to be, um, Sorry. you raised two important questions. Uh, I was informed that in, a, in the upcoming panel, both uh, the question of representation okay. of uh, researchers of, uh, of African descent, as well as the uh, role and the impact of history uh, on an individual 
but also on society in, in our present times, will be discussed at length. Okay. Okay. So Thank you me. raise important questions, but be assured, these will be issues that will be um, uh, discussed in, in, in our third panel. Okay, so, let me tell you this. Uh, we are the only uh, uh, group uh, in this panel who is actually broadcasting from Surinamese ground. Even though it's in Amsterdam, it is, <laughs> it is, it is the, the property of Surinamese people. So we will be watching you from this piece of Suriname and we will wait for the answers. Thank, thank you, you very much. It's always now. important to acknowledge the importance of having land because true, that is, of true, course, true. one of the and things that hour. colonizers yeah. do, take away land, uh, disappropriate people. Um, Yomi, you've been uh, listening very carefully, I see. Is there a, an, a question that you would like to bring up? And, and because of time, please, just one question to, to come up for, for the panel. Well, definitely, thank you so much for all of the panelists. It is a lot of information. We have to be honest, this is a lot of information to process. Um, I was, uh, while we were, you were talking, I was also talking with the group here and um, it needs time to just like land in all of our minds. Um, I think a few of the um, remarks that were made is that um, it's very positive to see that there's also more of a emphasis now on the, the resistance that was also there. Um, so not only being victims of, uh, but that enslaved are really also really more empowered in these all these different narratives that are coming up. And um, also definitely, if we look at all of these institutions, um, this book has brought together, I think, so many different researchers, and it's coming from a more, more academic point of view. Um, but generally, maybe, I, I actually agree with the person that said this, is that we have in the Netherlands very wide institutions, the research institutions are very wide, but these, these stories are linked together and are being told now also by different people, which is really important. So. Thank you, thank you for, for those comments and, and remarks. And uh, these are important things to, to think about. And, and all the panelists are, are in academic institutions, and I'm, I'm sure that they take your words, both from Vereniging on Suriname as well as from the ba Basel to heart. And um, I know for a fact that uh, you are uh, definitely aware of the fact that you are in institutions that have their own histories uh, that are uh, sometimes rooted and connected to colonialism and exploitation, and especially in the U.S., universities are now um, trying to come to terms uh, with that. Unfortunately, and we could have talked for hours, uh, I'm, I'm sure, but because of time, um, and please, uh, to all, everyone who is watching, all these uh, wonderful panelists have books coming out, uh, books that have just been um, published in the case of Nira uh, on, the, on the 29th of September, a wonderful book. So please, and even though uh, academic books are way too expensive for, uh, for regular folk, and that is also, one, one might say, um, a reflection on, of power relations that definitely need um, further interrogation. But for now, I would like you to join me, uh, even if it's in a virtual uh, forum, for a big hand for uh, Marjolaine Kars, Nira Vikramasinghe, Andriana Mosman, and Matthias van Rossum, who we all hope will get a call soon. And thanks for our friends at Vereniging on Suriname and the Basel, and we move on to the continuation uh, of, of our program. But please, FOSS and the Basel, stay tuned because you will be uh, able to, um, to, to voice your uh, questions and some of your questions will be answered. And if they're not answered to your satisfaction, please chip in uh, at, the, at the third panel. So thank you very much and um, have a great day for our friends from the United States and uh, that 
the same thing goes, even though the day has progressed further to our guests from Leiden and from Amsterdam. Take care. Bye. Thank you.